So what I want to do today is touch on a number of different topics. But I want to start with, um, and can we turn down the lights a little bit, please? I want to start with this. And what this is, um, how many people have heard of Bruce Coburn? Okay. For those of you who have not, Bruce Coburn is a contemporary folk musician from Canada. He's well known um, by some, but not certainly by all. And he has lyrics in a song that are something uh, along the lines, if a tree falls and in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, has it fallen? We can all figure that out because we could go look. So I want to dig a little bit deeper. If we have a species and it's not extinct, is it extinct until we can prove it's extant? Or is it extant? That it's demonstrably extant. Let's go a little bit deeper still. There are thousands of species that haven't been named. If those go extinct, do we know that they've ever been here? And what I'm trying to do with this is create the dissonance between uncertainty and conservation. And I'm going to wrap my talk around some of these uncertainties. And I'm going to start with the metaphorical snow ox. So what is a snow ox? Well, snow ox can occur in thick forests. They can also occur on mountaintops up to 5,500 meters, or if you're American like me and you refuse, not me, but the US refuses to try to understand metric, then you would be saying 18,000 feet. Um, snow oxen come in, other, in different forms. One form could be a species called a token in thick rhododendron forests in southern Asia, and they can come in golden fleece colors. Or they could be polar in nature and come with thick, luxuriant fur. And if we look at the two sketches of a token and its gold and a musk oxen and ask, who are the snow oxen, we can paint a number of species that are related. And we can line them up and we can give them names. And we can ask, well, what would the North American one be, which we're not going to touch on right now. But what we can do is we can build a phylogeny and go back to a common ancestor 15 million years ago. Okay, so we're going to return to this at some point. We're going to segue. Charles Darwin, known for bringing us natural selection and evolution, not known for his conservation words. But his conservation words were spoken in 1874 when he talked about the island of Aldabra in a letter to the British Parliament. And he talked about the importance of habitat. And if we lose the habitat, we lose the species. That was 1874, one billion people. That was also what's known as the Gilded Age of Exploration, when a lot of new species, new mammals, were coming forth. Since then, of course, we know what's happened. We've reproduced pretty much 140 some years. We've increased the number of people on the planet sevenfold. So what I want to do today is to talk about two twin challenges that we have. I'm going to talk about climate. I'm going to talk about population. I'm going to talk about this intersection between people, wildlife, and climate. And at some point, I'm going to pull some economics into this in a very simple way. But let me start with warming. And we know that both at the top of the world as well as on the roof of the world, We've got changes in snow regimes, changes in ice, changes in glaciers. And we know that we have species that have some resemblance. Wild yak here shown on the right, Tibetan plateau, musk ox on the left. And when we compare these two species, we find that they have some morphological similarities. Not only their hair, but certainly their skirts that drape on, almost to the ground. Now, we have to remember that conservation was born as a crisis discipline. Hi, how are you? Good. Good, me too, thanks. 
And we have this culture, sorry, of, of looking back when we think about conservation. Where are the last best 50 or 500 places? Where are the last pandas? Where are the last jaguars? But we're not looking ahead. And when we look ahead, we know that we're faced with this. We have an increasingly populated world. And on land, the global average is about 50 people per square kilometer. Uh, here's, here's where you guys are. And what I'm going to do today instead is I'm going to talk about um, countries that have lower densities. And I'm going to burrow in a little bit. So again, showing Canada here. In my talk, I'm going to focus on these three different geographies, Arctic Alaska, Tibetan Plateau, and then the Gobi Desert in part. And I'm going to script three different vignettes. I'm going to talk about biological diversity in the Central Asian highlands. And this is a churu, which was the mascot for the Beijing Olympics, not a panda, but a churu. I'm also going to go to the edge of a continent and talk about musk oxen. And then I'm going to go, instead of the latitudinal edge, I'm going to go to the altitudinal edge and go to wild yaks at 5,000 meters, because I'm practicing my metrics. OK, so I'm going to start with this question. Is climate or something else affecting persistence at the edge of a species range? And so let me give a quick little backdrop to the species. So these are musk oxen. And if you can't see them, they're in the mountains, which is more typical for them if they have mountains available. And what would the closest North American relative be to musk oxen? Bison? We're going to go to something that's not dark, but the other direction. Those are the most closest relative to musk oxen in North America, mountain goats. And so quick little snippet of natural history, and then we'll plow back into that question about is climate or something else driving persistence at the edge of the range. So well known for defense formations. Here we have an individual that was uh, injured, group standing tight, firmly. Um, we also have very cute little animals. These are their calves, uh, almost a year old, in a heat fog from the herd producing heat. Generally, winter herds have males. And so you have a male, a large male on your left, large male on your right, adult female in the center. Potential predators in these systems, polar bears, wolves, brown bears, also known here, of course, and in the US as grizzly bears. So if we look at a map, the map should tell us something about the abiotic factors that govern distribution. Not always, but just looking at distribution, we would expect that maybe something about temperature guides the range. And then also, at least in the US, they're at the edge of the range here in Alaska. What I'm going to do is to offer a little bit of background, and then I'll bring this forth to try to address the question. So three different populations that we've been um, focused on, two, really. Um, I'll just call them A, B, and C. Um, they're specific names. One is uh, Bering Land Bridge would be A, Cape uh, Cruz and Stern or Cape Thompson, B, Arctic Refuge, which is here up against the Canadian border, C. And when we look at this, what we find is that one population has done very well for almost 40 years, population A, high rate of population growth. Population B, pretty stagnant with a little bit of variance around it, not doing so well, declining now. And then Arctic National Refuge used to have about 400 some animals. And across about 12 years, it dropped down to about 10. Some of the Canadian animals that you have uh, in the Yukon have come from that population um, in the northeastern Alaska. So for my purposes, A is increasing, B is not, C is a goner. Our efforts are designed to answer questions about population growth. Here are some musk oxen in the center. But what I'm going to focus in on are these questions and then how we're trying to address them. And so we've structured a number of hypotheses geared towards understanding whether or not populations might have a high probability of persistence. A number of different factors may be involved, of course, disease and parasites, predation, some climate weather interaction, which can have an independent or a dependent impact on food, as well as can population density. So to test the food hypothesis, if nutrition 
if nutrition is constraining this population that's not doing well, what we could do is make some predictions about the factors that we should see, that should characterize this. Reduced body size, maybe poor body condition, maybe low, lower body mass, maybe a reduction in pregnancy, because we know one has to have at least some asymptotic level of nutrition to get pregnant and to carry the fetus to term. So methods we do are used to play cowboy biologists and bring in the Blackhawks. We've immobilized almost 220 animals. I've worked with Lane Adams for four years. Here we're looking at fat condition. These are a good set of teeth without any chips or breaks. Um, and then we weigh every animal. We've also gone to non-invasive methods. And we all know what this is. And so what we're trying to do is get a better handle on some of the potential correlates where we don't have to be tagging and harassing animals. And so, again, recall we're comparing two different populations and what we're asking are there differences in pregnancy rates for which we can use progestogens, a metabolic byproduct, and we can also use stress hormones. The prediction being there should be differences. We're also doing photoimaging. And so notice the tepid sun, biped on your far left approaching a group of muskox on your right. The reason we're doing photoimaging is because what we can do is treat the head sizes of young animals much as the way botanists and plant ecologists look at tree ring growth. So on any given tree ring, there's a little bit of an expansion. We can do this and photo, um, uh, develop photogrammetry techniques so we can measure the changes in head size and head growth. And we tested this against animals on a poor nutritional plane and a high nutritional plane over at the large animal research um, facilities in Fairbanks, where I know Susan Coots had spent a little time as well. And so when we do this, we can then take our images, put them on the computer, and get a sense for what the changes are for animals up to three years of age. So I'm going to play you a little video to try to give you a sense of what this is like in the field. Um, and let me figure out how to get this working. Okay, um, it's not easy to get your laser to work when the snow is coming sideways and it doesn't work. I mean, we have to be within 40 meters to get a good photo. So that was a failed attempt, and that attempt took almost a full day, um, but it didn't work. But so we were able to generate about 700 data points across seven years, and so that gave us a good sample. But some days, as you guys all know being here, are good days, and some days are not so good days. Okay, so let me get this. All right, so comparing two populations using a variety of different techniques to test hypotheses about correlates of population or demographic performance. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I just want you to, sh uh, to realize that shown here in the gray stippled is the population that is stable or declining. Shown in the white will be the population that is doing well. This is just a schematic of head sizes across seven different years. We'll return to that. So summing up so far before I go through some results, non-invasive follow-ups in the winter, snow machines, working with um, a couple of local people who are really good and fun to work with and know the landscape um, like the back of their hands, don't need GPS units like I do. And so we're measuring head sizes, stress hormones, pregnancy, annual growth of individuals, and looking at juvenile survival. OK, so food hypothesis. Four parameters on your left. Is one population doing better than the other? Juvenile size, no differences across seven years. No differences. Adult body mass, one of four years. Pregnancy, no differences. 
stress hormones, no differences. So is food limiting? Probably not. So something else is going on. What might it be? What about adult survival? So this is a radio collar of an uh, adult uh, muskox on the top left. Here it is again, grizzly bear on top. This animal did not die a peaceful death. So is predation affecting adult survival? When we look at this, no, not predation. OK, let's try something else. What about juvenile recruitment? Might that be responsible for the differences in growth trajectories between our two populations? We look at the differences here. Yes, consistent, strong differences. All right, so we know something's going on, but we don't know the relative contribution of different factors. Predation, disease, maternal ability, perhaps, maybe human predation. So I'm going to focus on this interaction between humans and uh, juvenile survival, perhaps. So as there is a greater offtake of adult males, what we find is a skew in sex ratios. So some herds don't have males. Does this impact social structure to the extent that it affects juvenile survival? We don't really know. What we can say is that we could expect an effect. For instance, what happens to groups when you pull out large males? So we're trying to figure this out. And we're suggesting, so our working hypothesis is, we don't know if this is true, but our working hypothesis is that if males play a strong role in anti-predator deterrent, we might expect groups that have males and groups that don't will vary in their responses. And we might expect differences in herd behavior. So a little bit about natural history, and then I'll tell you how we're testing that. So here's a group with three newborn calves on the top of a hill. Here's a group of bears, five grizzly bears down below working their way up. Well, unlike Serengeti and unlike Yellowstone, is anybody here who spends time in the Arctic or certainly in the Canadian wilderness, it's not so easy to get around. And one can't watch observations to the same extent that they could in places like East Africa or Yellowstone. So how do we test these predictions? We can use animal models. And people use animal models, and this stuff gets published in good journals because it's rigorous. And so what we're trying to do is to understand how groups with and without males respond to surrogate grizzly bears. And we're doing this not just with grizzly bears, but we have to have a control. And so we, again, have a familiar non-threatening object. And here's one of the playbacks. So all fours working with the herd. Notice the individual that is um, observing. And so we're, we're manipulating the system to understand responsiveness. Now at this point, I can say that the results aren't in because it takes a lot of time to do replication, to get to a group, not to scare a group, so we have to park snow machines a couple of miles away, post hole in. It takes a full day to get a data point. So we're in our third year of that, and we've got about 60 data points. And so we're getting, we're getting to near where we want to be. OK, I want to shift gears for a second, totally shift gears, and go to what is the cost of gathering data? And what is our responsibility in doing this? And so you recall I said that we were marking animals radio coloring animals, and so this is what we do. And when we do this, there's a little bit of a cost, but the big challenge for us is reuniting the downed female to the group. And of the 218 animals that we've immobilized, we've had pretty good success. Here you can see the group just staying and waiting for its group member to get up. But sometimes we have problems. When we have problems, the animals take off. And we can take the helicopter and chase them, but we know we burn calories. We scare the bejesus out of them. Or we could try doing the herd, and we've tried that too. But we have a strict cut point because we don't want to stress the animals anymore. And so what happens to the isolates? Here's one on a hill. Remember I said that they have a goat ancestry? 
But when they don't have hills like this or cliffs, what do they do? They do something different, something that we didn't know about, something that nobody knew about. They go into snow holes. They adopt basically a marmot strategy to be less vulnerable. They hang for up to two months. And so here's a snow hole, and inside the snow hole is a musk ox. And sometimes they give birth in the snow hole. And so if you look carefully, here's a newborn. So we've had three out of nine that have given birth that we know of. And so when we look at what are the stress levels, so forget the isolates for a second. So these are animals we've handled. These are animals that we haven't handled. There are virtually no differences. But when we look at what happens to the animals in the snow holes, oh, and no side effect, uh, meaning study side effect, no year effect. But when we do it and look at what happens to the isolated animals, and so comparing a group to an isolate, there's like a threefold increase in stress. OK, so bringing back to the question, climate or something else. So we found no evidence for food limitation. Had we been focusing exclusively just using abiotic factors and using meteorological and satellite um, data alone, we would have missed some important things. These help us, but we would have missed things like some of these interactions and juvenile recruitment differences. And then despite the remoteness, we, we think that there may be a human role, and that is this asymmetry in harvest, for which the state of Alaska has taken seriously, and they've changed the regulations on that, so that's real positive. Thinking about next steps, Wrangell Island. So Wrangell Island is the world's um, only, um, the Arctic's only world heritage site. Uh, it's in Russia. And there are reasons to expect that it's a climate refugium. Um, rain on snow events may be having an impact on muskox, and that's one of the things that we're trying to get at by using our photogrammetric approaches, especially looking at different stages in pregnancy. And then, potentially a role for males. Among the things that we discovered last year when we were spent part of the winter on Wrangell is polar bears are preying on musk ox. This is not scavenging, but it had been predation. And we've documented that by both males and females. Now, we don't know if that's a novel behavior and that's just happening or if that's happened throughout. We don't know that because people just haven't been out there or other places in the winter to disentangle. But we can say we now know that predation is occurring, although we don't know what the impacts are. I'm going to change gears. Instead of going north, we're going to go up in elevation. And I'm going to focus on questions about globalization and garment trade and how it affects native biodiversity on the Tibetan Plateau. So let me start with the situation with more people and more complexity. And I'm going to focus on the US, and I'm going to focus on China. Land area is about the same. China has about four times as many people and about 10 times as many cities with a million or more. But given this heterogeneity across the landscape, that also means that there are parts of China that maybe are not as densely populated. Similarities, crowds in the east, Beijing, New York, go to the west just like here in Canada, get a lot of open space, good mountains. Cheru in the top, an ecological equivalent, pronghorn in the bottom. And the question that I want to address is, does Western culture affect regional biodiversity? If so, how? And if we know how, are there things that we can do about that? So that's what I want to focus on, but I'm going to give you some backdrop first, and then I'll come back to the question. So I'm going to talk about Tibetan Plateau, Northwest India, the Ladakh area, and then also Mongolia and the Gobi Desert, which are not part of Tibet, independent. That's what we would call Outer Mongolia. And I want to introduce you to the species that I want to talk about, the landscapes, and then the people. And I'll bring this back to the people-wildlife climate interface that I talked about a little while ago. So collaborators, Eileen Kong from WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society, 
Vuve Bader, a former student of mine who's finishing his PhD in Massachusetts, and Churu Mishra, who heads the Snow Leopard Trust. Traditional Asia looks something like this, a high reliance on native animals, uh, sorry, on domestic animals with a, a, a ancestral um, native species. They also have a lot of goats. A hundred years ago, British military officer Cecil Rollins was doing some explorations on behalf of the Brits who have an interest in the world like a lot of places. And in his travels, he noted that people maintain goats at high elevation throughout winter so that they'll have really thick fur. And that thick fur is called pashim. It's the under wool of goat hair. It's made for cashmere. It's converted to cashmere or called pashmina, which one can find in chic stores in Bangkok. They can find it in airports. And you can find it over in Italy and France and I'm sure in Canada. So if we look at the cashmere trade and where it's going, we find that 90% of the world's cashmere comes out of Mongolia and China, 90%. And so if consumerism is affecting biodiversity in Central Asia, several preconditions must occur. So what are those preconditions? Well, as I've said, imports to the West, which I'll define as a truism because I already said that's happening. Um, but there need to be incentives for, for herders. Also, that the relative increase in goats exceeds that of other livestock. And finally, that there are negative effects on local diversity. So let me tell you the study system, go through some of the study areas, introduce the species. I'll refresh your memory of the fundamental question. So study systems. One is the Gobi Desert. Here you see uh, some little white. Yeah, OK. So these are called gares, what in Russian are called yurts. Um, these are where some of the semi-nomadic pastoralists live. This is an area where saiga occur. Saiga are the world's most northern antelope. Saiga used to occur in Canada. This was their distribution into what we call now or refer to as Beringia. So basically, the Mackenzie River Delta going west. So Saiga were here. They were in Alaska all the way over to England. This is what Saiga look like in their native range now in Mongolia, which gives you a hint as to what Alaska and northern parts of Yukon once looked like, a little bit more arid than it is now. And we had focused on Saiga um, for about six years doing some population ecology. Other species in this system are Kiang. So Saiga are an endangered species. Kiang are a wonderful native species. They're uh, a hemione, which is half ass, half horse, but a native species. This picture is almost 5,000 meters. So Saiga endangered, Kiang endangered, wild yak endangered, Churu also endangered. This picture is from about 5,300 meters, very high elevation. Snow leopards, another endangered species. Blue sheep, not endangered but the major prey of snow leopards, Tibetan gazelles, which, and then four other endangered species, Bactrian camel, Hulan, which are the low elevation version of Kiang. These are in the Gobi. Uh, Taki, which are Przewalski horses, the Mongolian name are Taki, and then Przewalski gazelles. So bringing this back, how do Western cultures affect regional biodiversity? The one thing I haven't talked about yet are local people and their lifestyles. And this is, of course, central. So dependence on products, of course, goat and sheep. And like every place in the world, things are changing. Where yaks and horses used to be used for transportation, we now have motorcycles and trucks. And so let's consider how goats have changed across time. And I'm going to start then with India and Ladakh. And we see across three decades, there's been a three to five fold increase in domestic goats. If we do this in Mongolia, we find something similar. So essentially what we have is a rapid proliferation of goats. So how does this square with the six different protected areas that I was showing and talking about this realm of native species? What's the relative abundance? And so I'll show you livestock and stippled, 
native ungulates in black across this, uh, these landscapes. And what we find are, this is the relative abundance of livestock in these protected areas. And this is what we have for the native species. Now, models in Canada and in North America are very different for what goes into national parks. But the point here is that only 3 to 8 percent of the large mammals in these systems are native. This is an example of domestic trailing um, in the Altai Mountains. So I'm going to give you a test. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for a snow leopard. And so can you find the snow leopard in this photo? OK, I'm going to, uh, I'll give you a hint. It's going to look like this. OK, I'll narrow the field. We're going to narrow the playing field. It's in the top left quadrant. Top left quadrant. OK. Um, all right, more livestock, more conflict. More livestock, more conflict. So what we're seeing is an intensification of ecological effects. What are some of these? I'm not going to read them all to you because you can all read, but I'll just point out for a variety of these species, we've been able to document, including even changes in food suppression affecting birth rates in blue sheep. But I'll draw your attention to this one, dog-associated predation. Because with herders, there are dogs. And while there's such a strong focus on biological diversity, I think that people are not only forgetting the human livelihood question, but also what comes with that. And we see this reasonably vividly here in a paper that my postdoc, Julie Young, and a number of us had um, published a few years ago. So what's missing from this equation? Well, of course, the central thing are livelihoods. And so let's talk about livelihoods a little bit. And let's talk about how people from one part of the world are fueling products to another part of the world. And so when we think about, well, what are the incentives? If we look at the changes in consumer price index across time and what a herder can make, the rate at which herders are increasing their gains from cashmere, uh, from the raw wool for cashmere is huge. So there's great incentive. So what we're looking at is a chain of interactions, but not one with top predators, but one with consumerism. Last year in Santa Fe, New Mexico, one could buy very inexpensive cashmere scarves. So the question really is, is why would we expect poor herders to care about international agreements when they're barely making a living? And I think the answer is that we don't expect them to care. We expect them to do what all of us do, make a living. So how do we move this forward? You know, what are our options? And so one of the things that we've been doing is putting on workshops in the small little villages where these herders are. We've invited the military. We've invited the police. We've invited the local mayors. We've invited herder associations to try to all get on the same page. What we've also been talking with them about is whether or not replacing goat hair with something like camels, which have a far less negative impact on the local environment, or also asking about yaks, because domestic yaks are something like 14 million domestic yaks in the world. And so some people are also moving towards yaks. So our next steps are to try to address some of these issues with workshops um, in London, uh, and I know certainly it's not on the mind of anybody in Paris, understandably, but that was um, at least one of the places we were thinking about as well as in New York. We've been putting op-eds in places during Fashion Week to bring this home, um, and then through my collaborators putting things out in either The Guardian or also in the journal Nature, and then in more popular outlets in India. And so, again, this is where we see where our, our next steps are going to address this, including a couple of pilot projects. So I'm going to switch gears and go to the final vignette. And we're going to go to climate issues on the roof of the world. And I think it's very clear, uh, irrespective of where we're um, looking 
to our science. We know that there have been very strong mass reductions in glaciers. We know uh, across about 700 glaciers that have been sampled in the Tibetan region. Most of them are showing reductions in mass. The stuff has been published in you know, all the really good journals. So let me set some context. So here are four very high elevation species mammals. You have ecological surrogates for this, either with doll sheep or stone sheep or bighorn sheep. You also have, um, for red deer, we have um, elk here. Um, and so there are some equivalents, but not at such high elevations. Across the Tibetan Plateau, we have a very strong, in fact, a striking precipitation gradient from 50 millimeters in the west to up to 800 moving towards the east. And wild yak density follows this gradient. When we think about yaks, I guess to make it closer to home, we should think about bison. In fact, Canada did the first hybridization between yaks and bison to create a better working beast in 1927 in northern Alberta. Um, there are some similarities, family groups, also mixed herds. Yaks live in a periglacial environment. You can see yaks at the very bottom of this um, photo. Uh, and these are wild yaks. Everything I'm going to talk about at this point on is going to be about wild yaks. Um, they also occur um, a bit higher. And one assumes that habitat selection is where we find the animals. There's a little bit of circularity there, but we assume that if there are no fences, animals will select the areas that are best. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, yaks use extreme elevations. And Sven Heden, uh, a Swedish explorer, a very famous Swedish explorer, talked about over 100 years ago how yaks are regularly found at the margins of glaciers. And so we assume that that must be important habitat to them. Again, I use that word assume. When we consider, based on our data, the locations of male and female yaks, which remember usually live in separate groups, we find that there are no sex differences. Males and females both use about the same elevation high, about 50, a little bit, uh, somewhere between 5,000 and 5,400 uh, meters. Um, Males will go a little bit higher, but overall, no sex differences. So how might warming affect yak e ecology? And that's clearly an imprecise question, because there are lots of ways to look at, well, what are the response variables? What are we trying to measure? So I'm going to focus on sex. But sex is in gender, not reproductive sex. Array of tools available. And so let's, let's consider how we might use these. So the working expectation is this. If one sex is more vulnerable than another, we should see males or females doing something very differently. And potentially, this has changed across time. So let me get a little bit more specific. I'm going to talk about three different expeditions that we took, field work that was dealing with habitat ecology, looking at the differential distribution and densities of the two sexes, and then remote sensing. So the field work component, kind of like the Arctic other than using a truck, kind of brutal, cold, just cold. We do the work in winter, just like in the Arctic, because we can move across the landscape reasonably efficiently. Um, amongst the findings, so uh, NDVI is a measure of plant greenness. We find that females are more reliant on certain sites than are males. No differences in distance to glacial edges. No differences in terms of aversion to snow. And then certainly there is a group size difference. Um, and that's by definition, females are in groups. Here's a key finding. Females occur 20 times close, closer to snow than males, to snow patches. This is what it looks like. I'll point out that these are undetectable when we're doing our satellite imagery, because it's just a little bit of splattering. So we wouldn't have detected this not being on the ground. So females are 20 times closer to snow than males. Here's the question. I'll give you a hint. OK, so here's the hint. What is that? That's ice. OK, so middle of January, middle of February, 
there's no water. There's no available water. So females need water. But what about males? Is there some inherent difference in the middle of winter between male and female reliance on water? There is if females are lactating. Females are lactating at minus 30 centigrade. We wouldn't have detected this. This is a natural history gee whiz factoid. But we would have never known what was going on had we not been out there to realize that. I want to talk about habitat use across time. And there's some marvelous information out in these historic accounts. And there have been more than 120 expeditions across the Tibetan Plateau. And out of those 120, we were able to find 59 accounts and expeditions between 1974 in 1925 that broke down whether or not the travelers were seeing females or males in groups, not in groups, on flats or on slopes. So we were able to cull information before yaks went through massacres, just like bison did here in Canada and like they did in the US. And so we were able to get a sense as to what was going on before they were heavily predated. And so what I'm going to do is just to compare percent use of alpine steppe, which are kind of flat level areas, pre and post exploitation. And here's what we find. So I'll draw your attention to the right. What we have is that females have decreased by 33% their use of open areas. And so we're calling these legacy effects, although these effects may come about for a number of other reasons. So key finds here is that to the extent possible, we should consider how we may shape longer periods of time how animals use habitats. Certainly we know this for elephants and poaching and use of national parks. We see this for elk. We see this for moose. Maybe we're seeing this for yaks. And then Females may be more constrained than males as we have additional changes in precipitation and snow regimes because of their reliance on snow during lactation. So I started this talk by considering remote species that could serve as a metaphor for remote and interactions with climate and people. When we think about the world's population density, we know we've got some challenges. My perspective is it doesn't matter where we work. One can work in really remote areas, and you can certainly see the Canadian Arctic there, and this is how long it takes to get to a city. Um, Tibet is similar, parts of the Arctic are. It doesn't matter where one works, it matters what one does and what one tries to accomplish. And so how do we know if our efforts are working? Sometimes we know, sometimes we don't. But I think that we can leave with some optimism in the 1980s, when my colleague George Schaller first started working in China, and he would use the word conservation, he said people's eyes would glaze over. They didn't even know what that word means. And now what we have in China is a protected area system in western China the size of California. If you go to southern Africa, five countries have bound together to create the Kavango Zambezi Initiative, which is about the size of California again. If we look more closely at home, we have the US in 2008 dedicated its first national migration corridor called the Path of the Pronghorn. It's not huge, um, but it's a two square kilometer wide, 70 mile corridor through lands that are protected to assure migrations. I don't know as much about Canada, I, I apologize, um, but Yellowstone to Yukon, and there must be many other initiatives that are showing promise. And so I think with that, I would just like to say thanks so much. I've had tons of help across the last 20 years, of which some of this is what I've presented. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions if I can figure out the lights. don't run.
they, they um, so their strategy is very different. It's the exact opposite of caribou. Caribou can be fleet and they avoid predators and uh, muskox are not migratory. They put on globs and layers of fat and their strategy is just total energy conservation. So their metabolic rates reduce in the winter by about a third. They're the, the above ground version of a grizzly bear. Bears go under, live off of their fat. I mean, all species live off of their fat, but so muskox are not into running. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't, and so we're pretty careful about it, but we need to get pretty close to get accurate um, photos, photo measures. What's your hope uh, the concept compared to the reality? What is my hope compared to the reality for? Well, okay, so um, it, it, I was meeting with um, Susan Coots and her graduate students and we were talking about this exact question. How do we take the science beyond just information and education and fascination and inspiration and knowledge? How do we, is there some direct role we can take that? And so I think maybe with the unraveling that we've been starting to work on in Tibet and the Kashmir trade, there are opportunities there, but it's not just closing the Kashmir trade because, of course, we have to figure out what the livelihoods of herders are, which is why we have them in these discussions to try to figure out the way in which we can configure things better. And we're just starting. But so that's one where I can see, you know, we're taking the science and we're starting to move that ahead. And certainly their products, uh, 100 years ago, ostrich feathers were in fashion that went out of fashion within about 10 years. We have ostriches. You know, so there's certain things that can be done. Um, the yak stuff right now, what we're trying to do is to figure out how much space is required. And some of the major issues are hybridization issues because you have 14 million domestic yaks. Not all of those are in China, but there are certainly a high proportion. And so it's how do we keep things segregated? So we have to know about movements. We have to know what females are going to do and how climate change may affect them, but still paying attention to what the herders need for their animals. And so there's some tangible things. The muskox one is really hard. And if you want to join us for a beer, we can try to do that one because I need help. Um, someone else. Yes. It's, it's, it's your Steve Harper replacement, of course. <laughs> uh, um, so, okay, how would I answer that? Um, we're, uh, everybody keeps saying we're at a precipice, but that precipice keeps moving and moving. But we certainly see the effects of that. We see it in so many ways. We see it across society. I mean, you look at Paris, you know, and we can say, yes, it was related because there's uh, concern about resources and how do we allocate resources and whose resources are they? Are they oil resources? Are they water? You know, there's just lots of ways to paint issues, but if we can't solve demography, we've got huge issues. And we need people who stand up and say that. Uh, yes, and then I'll go. It, it, it's safer to talk about climate change than it is the rate at which we're losing habitat because of humans. Because one is a much more immediate threat on our visceral beliefs 
and it, it's, you know, that's a failing. To some, uh, yeah, absolutely, we are, we are. Um, one second. Okay. They've done much better with Vicuña, um, marketing and regulating Vicuña. So Vicuña, as you probably know, you know, were on the verge of extinction, and there was an incentive to save them, and they market wool, and they do a, a, a very good regulated job of that. Um, the issue, so they've gotten that one, and there's some lessons. So one of the people that we've invited to come to one of our workshops is somebody who works with Vicuña because they have experience that we don't, and we want to understand um, from there. Actually, two um, people who work with it, one the herder perspective and one a government perspective, which is different. So, no, but that's a, it's, it's, it's totally valid. Um, thank you. Yes? Hi, I wonder what talking about this beginning right here, right at the beginning here, mm -hmm. the one that we're going to define and the one that we're going to share. Right. Yeah, so I didn't address that, and you raised a good question, and, and thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, so hunting, in, at least in the U.S., you can hunt in refuges, you can't hunt in national parks. And so there, for about a 12-year period, there was a very um, concentrated effort to take males because using the normal model of a polygynous mammal, one assumes you just have another male comes in, and it's not like an infanticidal thing. So just removing the males. And then it took a while for people to start to really consider, well, maybe there's this issue going on. And nobody's really addressed it. We just know that across a landscape, there's a skew. And we know that at some level, there's poor recruitment. But nobody's been on the ground to see these interactions. And so there are a couple of other plausible hypotheses. And that's why we're just trying to use behavior to get at an inference, which will give us a little bit better information than rather than saying, well, it's got to be this, because at least we should be trying to think like scientists. Um, let's go here, and then I'll go there. Uh, it has, so, okay, so Wrangell Island in Russia, no hunting. And so that's uh, close. It's about a nine males for every 10 adult females. And so it's like, uh, it's pretty close to a symmetry. Um, in some of these, it's been uh, about a 9 to 1 ratio of females to males, so 10 to 15 percent. So, so very skewed. Uh, you had a question. Um, so I'm going to answer in two ways, but I'll try to be very direct. Um, so we don't have good data on the condition of animals when they're killed. Our suspicion, actually, we have some data. So wolves are not a major predator in this system. Wolves are there, but because caribou are so abundant and easier to kill, wolves preferentially are taking more caribou. The few times where we've had very intense predation by wolves, the caribou have moved out uh, 200 to 300 kilometers, just gone. There's nothing left. I'm not sure why the wolves didn't follow, but they didn't. But then they took out a couple of musk ox groups pretty effectively. But that was super deep snow, and musk ox are not built for deep snow. So a bunch of mitigating factors. The bear situation is different. It seems that it occurs, um, well, obviously it can occur in the winter when bears are down. So it occurs when bears are up. But it's more often in the spring. And uh, musk oxen, like most northern temperate 
mammals are in poor condition in the spring because they're still working off of their winter reserves. So that's when more of the predation is occurring from what we can detect. But we don't know the scale at the specific group level, whether there are males in the group or not. Part of our research, what we're starting to find, you know, so I said, well, we have data, but I didn't tell you what it was, is what we're finding is that groups without males are much more likely to run when we approach as the fake bear. And so what do they tell you if you run into a bear in Jasper? Don't run. So when muskox run, it's not a good outcome. And so we're not sure that that's the case, but when we've been charged by, uh, we've only been charged by males, um, and males are much less abundant in these groups, and so the differential in terms of the behavior is about 15 or 20 to one. We're, we're highly likely to be charged by a male, never so far, but we don't let down our guard by a female. And then human hunters um, uh, have traditionally been taking a lot more males, but in the state of Alaska, they've changed it. And I have no clue, and I would love to find out more about what's going on in, in Canada with the hunting of muskox and whether or not one sex or the other seems to be more preferred. Yes? Okay, good question. So, um, so I'm going to repeat it, but if I'm wrong, then stop me, okay? So I think um, that the question is, how effective is the bear model for simulating a bear? Um, so we've done this three ways. Approaching as a human, approaching as a bear, approaching as a caribou. Bear always gets the response. Bear always gets the response. I mean, it depends, like, how far away, you know, a couple of different conditions, but we don't worry about prevailing wind, one, because muskox are not all that olfactory, and two, it's always the same person who's in the field a long time and smelly. Yeah. Okay. okay, one more question, then you guys. Sure. Okay, okay, okay. So let me rephrase that a little for people in the back, but if I get that wrong, just let me know. Um, so the question is, to what extent is the use of snow machines potentially changing the behavior of muskox? Um, and you're asking that not for when we're doing our, our fake model, but a, a, a broader question. Okay, okay. Um, so I do know, so when we used to go out with a helicopter, to dart muskox, uh, the herds would look at us and you know, we would uh, immobilize them. The next day we would come back, they were terrified. We couldn't get within two miles. They're already moving and running. So very, very fast at learning. So bringing back, that, uh, back to snow machines, I would find it hard to imagine that they haven't changed their behavior as a consequence. Okay, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks.